In this presentation, I'm going to run through the role of SPECT CT in imaging of the spine. I'm going to explain some of the more common indications for using SPECT CT in investigating patients with low back pain. And we're also going to cover some of the post-operative complications that you can see with SPECT CT in patients with back pain. First of all, why would we use SPECT CT in investigating patients with back pain? Well, part of the problem is that lower back pain is very common. It's estimated that up to 11% of people suffer from severe pain at some point in their lives in their lower back. The causes of back pain are multiple and it can be really difficult to make a clinical diagnosis. And this is because the pathology can be related to any of the components of the spine, so, such as the discs, the, the joints or the nerve roots. When we image the spine with SPECT CT, um, we can look at multiple different pathologies at the same time. So we can look at joint degeneration, whether that's in the facet joints, the intervertebral joints. Uh, we can identify Schmorz nodes. We can look for stress fractures, such as PARS defects and spondylolisthesis. We can assess for transitional vertebrae, which can result in pseudoarthrosis or can be partially fused. And we can also assess the sacral iliac joints. So we must remember to look for joint degeneration in the sacral iliac joints and causes of pelvic instability. SPECT CT is well known to identify pain generators in the lumbar spine. Uh, a study done by my colleagues at the Royal Free has shown that SPECT CT has been successful in identifying pain generators in 92% of patients in the cervical spine and 86% of patients in the lumbar spine. We also know that SPECT can be used to target the facet joint injections and uh, studies have shown that there's a good response, uh, up to between 87 and 95 percent successful targeting of SPECT guided injections. And the other useful thing to know is that SPECT guided injections are more successful than those that are SPECT negative on bone scans. If we decide to use SPECT-CT to identify facet joint arthritis and target the facet joints, uh, we could rely on a CT-based grading system, uh, such as the one that's shown here. Uh, this is, uh, you can see that there's four different grades, uh, zero where there's normal facet joint space, one where there's mild narrowing of the facet joints and small osteophytes forming, uh, then further narrowing of the facet joints, moderate osteophytes and hypertrophy, uh, and also subarticular erosions. And then finally, you've got severe arthritis where you've got severe subarticular erosion, subchondral cysts, and large osteophytes. However, the uptake does not always correspond to the CT appearances, and this is where the SPECT CT can be very useful in guided targeted injections. So we must remember that if we are going to rely on the SPECT CT for targeting facet joints, we need to look at the SPECT uh, over and above the CT appearances. Also, the SPECT CT guided injections are not necessarily going to be successful on their own and need to be used in conjunction with physiotherapy. When deciding which joints to target on the SPECT CT, I find that the MIP images, the maximum intensity projection images, are the most useful. I think as a general rule of thumb, it's quite useful to label the uh, levels as we've done here on these images, so that it avoids any doubt as to actually which level you're talking about when you're uh, writing your report. One question that we're often asked is, uh, how much of the lumbar spine do you uh, include? Do you just target the, um, the CT, do you just perform CT on the, um, the SPECT component that's hot, or do we do SPECT CT of the whole spine? Um, and I think the answer to that is 
we have to consider those considerations. So in pediatrics, where we are more concerned about the additional radiation dose from the CT component, uh, we may well limit our CT to just the level that we're concerned with. And that could be done based on the specs that we've acquired. However, in an older patient where the dose consideration is not as uh, significant, uh, we, will, we may well include the whole spine from T12 uh, to S1, and we usually will include the bottom of the sacral iliac joints, as this is often a cause for pain generation. One important normal variant to look out for when you're reporting spec CT scans of the lumbar sacral spine is the transitional lumbar sacral segment. This can lead to so-called Bertolotti syndrome. Um, the transitional lumbar sacral segment is present in 3 to 21% of people and can start off as, as, as just an enlarged unilateral transverse process and can present as articulations which are partially or fully fused with the sacrum. Often there may be a vestigial intervertebral disc space. And the reason why these are important is that they can lead to altered biomechanics. Uh, often if you've got a fused lumbar sacral segment, you may have increased stress at the disc level above. There is a classification system for characterizing these lumbar sacral transitional vertebrae, uh, the Castelby classification. Um, the reason why it's important to consider using some class, such classification is that, as you can see in the type 2 uh, pseudoarthrosis, where there is a, a fibrous fusion of the transverse process with the sacrum, uh, either unilateral or bilateral. Well, these are prone to have pseudo-articulations and pseudo-arthroses at these levels. In the 2A and 3A, where you've got a unilateral uh, fusion, uh, because of the stability or partial stability at that level, patients are prone to get a contralateral facet joint arthritis. Type 3 and type 4 have osseous fusions of the lumbar sacral segment. And this usually can lead to adjacent segment arthritis in the level immediately above. Schmall's nodes are something that you may well be familiar with if you report MRI scans of the spine. They are herniations of the intervertebral disc through the amplate. They can be related to Schumann's disease. They can be infective in nature that can be related to degenerative disease or can sometimes be related to compressive vertebral loading. They're usually asymptomatic, or asymptomatic but acute Schmoll's nodes are inflammatory and can be painful and are often avid on spec CT in the acute phase. In the chronic phase, the uptake reduces to normal background vertebral activity. One thing that's important to bear in mind is you may not see the uptake on the planar bone scan. So if you are concerned about any pain in the spine, then you should perform a spec CT. When we perform a lumbar sacral spine spec CT, we make sure we include the sacral iliac joints. The sacral iliac joints are not very well visualized on planar scintigraphy, uh, and we don't rely on that anymore for diagnosing ankylosing spondylitis. SPEC CT can be useful um, in differentiating causes of sacral iliac joint pain, or for instance, if you have a patient with atypical features on MRI. You can combine spec CT with quantification of the sacral iliac joints. However, it's not something that we routinely perform as we don't feel it adds much clinical value. The advantage of performing spec CT in sacral iliac joints is it helps to identify degenerative sacral iliac joints. It helps differentiate 
degenerative joint disease from stress fractures of the sacrum and can also be useful in identifying a little known normal variant called the accessory sacral iliac joints. Now the sacral, accessory sacral iliac joints are usually positioned at the level of the second dorsal uh, neural foramen uh, and can result in a pseudoarthrosis which can be painful. Spec CT is very useful in the investigation of uh, discitis and osteomyelitis in the spine. Um, the example on the left here shows a Gallian Spec CT scan, and the example on the right shows a bone syntogram with Spec CT. It's shown that actually bone scans with Spec CT are equivalent to MRI in identifying discitis. They can be useful as part of whole body imaging. Um, if you've got a patient with parks of unknown origin and you want to exclude discitis, then it can be combined with a whole body planar scan. The thing to differentiate degenerative changes from discitis on the CT component of the spec CT is the end plate erosion, which is a sensitive and specific marker of uh, discitis. The other thing to look out for is paravertebral abscess, which you can pick up with the non-contrast CT component of the spec CT. So we're going to talk now a little bit about uh, post-operative imaging with spec CT. Um, one of the most common complications that we see is loosening of pedicle screws. And spec CT has been very useful in identifying uh, loosening of pedicle screws. Uh, in some studies, um, SPEC CT was able to uh, reclassify 45.2% of causes of pain over planar or SPEC imaging alone uh, in identifying causes of loosening uh, for uh, the spine. It has a high accuracy of loosening, sensitivity of 100%, and specificity of 89.7%, according to one study. So, what is pedicle screw loosening and what does it look like on SPEC CT? Well, one of the causes of pedicle screw loosening is metawork failure. So, there may be a fracture of the screw. So, that's something you certainly can look out for and identify on the CT component. The other thing is uh, the periprosthetic lucency, uh, which occurs around the metalwork. You can sometimes see migration of the metalwork and, of course, increased uptake as a result of that loosening. Sometimes the screw can become loose and can result in lateral recess impingement. So it's important to look in the uh, lateral recess of the spine to see if there's any nerve root impingement from the screws. So here we've got an example of lateral recess impingement on the right. Uh, screw impingement can occur because either the screw has been incorrectly placed in the first place there could be migration of the screw because of loosening. And as I mentioned before, if it impinges on the lateral recess of the spinal canal, it can result in nerve root impingement. Patients who have degenerative disc disease uh, are sometimes considered for an interbody fusion. And this is when the surgeon places a cage device in the disc space to replace the degenerative disc itself. There's usually uh, either stripping away of the surface of the bone or implantation of some sort of bone graft material into that disc space which promotes ossification and growth at that level. So normally, if you look at the CT component, by about six months, you will start to see some ossification. And usually by a year, such as on the example here on the right, you will see complete ossification. You will see cross bridging of bone and cortical uh, bone bridging across uh, that level. 
However, there are occasions where the fusion doesn't work. And if there's increased uptake at that level, you can try and determine what has happened. One of it may be due to um, pedicle screw loosening. Uh, the pedicle screws are usually placed posteriorly to stabilize the joint while the interbody cage device has time to fuse. It may be that you've got subsidence of the um, cage device. Subsidence of the cage device is when the prosthesis migrates through the end plate. Um, and this can lead to non-union of that segment. And subsequently, because there's continuous chronic movement, you get failure of ossification. Another complication that you have with patients who have a successful fusion at a particular level is adjacent segment arthritis. Now adjacent segment arthritis occurs up to 31% of patients after fusion of the lumbar spine. And this is because if you have successfully fused uh, a degenerative disc level, then that segment becomes rigid and so you result in excess motion at the next level, either below or above. Uh, unfortunately, on MRI or CT, the changes that you might see in adjacent segments on the, in the discs and the facet joints may not be symptomatic. And this is where plus spec CT is particularly useful because it can identify the pain generator um, and things like the um, facet joints that could be degenerative as a result of adjacent segment arthritis. These are some more examples of adjacent segment arthritis. On the left, we have adjacent segment arthritis in the facet joints below the fused segment. In the middle image and on the right image, we have successful fusion of the lower lumbar spine between L3 and the sacrum. However, at the level above at L2-3, there is increased movement and adjacent segment arthritis and increased uptake at that level. So in summary, SPEC-CT is excellent at localising pain generators and mechanical back pain. We've shown how it can be useful as an adjunct to clinical assessment and is very useful in assessing post-operative complications. It can also guide therapy. It can direct uh, the surgeon um, to which facet joint or which level needs to be operated on and can also determine whether joint injections are going to be successful or not based on the intensity of uptake. But we need to remember that the diagnosis and treatment of back pain is multidisciplinary, and that is when it's most successful. So often a uh, conservative approach and physiotherapy is what's needed to treat patients with back pain. And certainly SPEC-CT has a role to play in that. And Identifying patients who wouldn't benefit from treatment is almost as useful as identifying those patients who can. I've included some references here for further reading, so uh, you can find out a little bit more about how SPECT is useful in investigating patients with back pain. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, please email me on my address uh, shown here. Thank you.